We basically made this design, this idea of trying to use an electrostatic levitation to study structure, first not with this particular electrostatic levitation facility, but with one that was owned by NASA. So I came up with the idea, we convinced NASA to try it. And we went together to a synchrotron where you have a very, very bright source of X-rays. And we went to the advanced photon source near Chicago. And with the design changes that I had incorporated, we were able to look at the structure of the liquid as it went below the supercooled state. So the first thing we were able to do was to prove a hypothesis that had been made in the 1950s to explain why you could supercool a liquid metal. It goes all the way back to the 1700s when Fahrenheit first observed with water that you can take a liquid below its melting temperature and it stays a liquid. It shouldn't. As soon as you cross the melting temperature, it should crystallize. But there's a barrier to that crystallization. That allows us then to supercool it. What Fahrenheit also discovered was that if you introduce dirt or some kind of sudden shock or something like that, that will cause the liquid to spontaneously crystallize. So it limits how far below the melting temperature we can take it. These are very highly reactive liquids. They tend to be made of metals like zirconium, which reacts with, with virtually everything. So if you put those liquids in a container, they would react with the container, and they would also end up having these heterogeneities, they're called, like the, the dust that, and dirt that Fahrenheit was talking about, and that causes them to crystallize, to nucleate. So it lowers the nucleation barrier by having these particles there. So if we have them in touch with a container, we won't be able to supercool them. Nucleation is in biological systems, it's in physical systems. Nucleation that we study here is of the liquid going to the crystal. But there are examples of nucleation that are perhaps more familiar. Whenever you open up a bottle of beer and you pour it into a glass, you'll notice that there are bubbles. And the reason there are bubbles is that you have more carbon dioxide dissolved in the beer than is in what's called equilibrium at normal atmosphere. So the dissolved carbon dioxide wants to come out. And the way in which it comes out is it nucleates within the liquid small gas bubbles, and then those grow, and then that's what you see when, when the carbon dioxide comes to the surface. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that very often the carbon dioxide is coming from particular spots on the beer glass. And that's an example of heterogeneous nucleation, where there's something there, perhaps a bit of dirt or a bit of lint, or maybe there's a crack, a small crack in the glass. Any of those things allow nucleation to happen more easily. And that's very analogous to what I was saying about putting a liquid in a container. It's the same idea that you have imperfections in the container or you have dirt, and that's what causes uh, the preferential nucleation. It wasn't until the 1950s that it was ever demonstrated you could supercool a liquid metal. And the reason is because of the tendency for liquid metals to react with things. Charles Frank came up with a hypothesis, and what he argued was that what was going on in a metallic liquid was that you were ordering, but you were ordering to a structure which had an icosahedral symmetry, which was incompatible with the type of symmetry that a crystal would want to have. And so that local symmetry had to be broken before it could crystallize, and that was what gave rise to this ability to supercool gave rise to the large nucleation barrier. So the first experiment we did back in 2003 was to prove for the first time experimentally that at least in the one system, a metallic system, that was correct. We have a sample that uh, is about the size of a BB that we uh, put into the chamber between two plates that are held at a very, very large voltage difference between the two plates. The sample acquires a charge naturally by a process called induction, where you get charge separation on the sample. That causes the sample to be attracted then to the top plate and repelled by the bottom plate, so it levitates, it stays there. Its position is controlled in space by two other sets of electrodes, two other plates that are off to the side, and we control the position by looking at where the sample is using a laser and a detector and another laser back there that are at 90 degrees, they're cross lasers, and we look at where the shadow of the sample is on the detector and we apply a voltage to the two side plates, two sets of side plates, to keep the sample in the position we want. Then what we do is we bring in another laser that's a high power laser and we melt the sample. So now we have a liquid that's suspended between these plates, very well localized, very well positioned, not touching anything. It's true that all liquids, if you cool them fast enough, will form a glass. They go through a transition, it's a real transition, but we don't understand it, 
uh, from the liquid to the glass. It's called the glass transition. It's one of the most remarkable transitions in the universe in the sense that over a very, very small temperature range, the viscosity, which again is the, uh, the ability of a liquid to flow, changes by many, many orders of magnitude, so it becomes much, much more viscous. It becomes a solid. So as you go through the glass transition, you go from something that's freely flowing like a liquid into something that's rigid like a glass. Liquid metals tend to want to crystallize much more readily than silicate liquids. Um, so even though we can supercool for quite some distance, eventually if we just cool slowly, in most cases it will turn into a crystal. Now what has changed is the discovery of a new class of metallic glasses which are called bulk metallic glasses. These are glasses that are made of metals, but they actually do form glasses when you cool them slowly, sometimes as slowly as a silicate, traditional silicate glass. We don't know why these materials form glasses so easily and others don't. There are many ideas out there and we're trying to test some of those. But one of the things that makes these glasses remarkably similar and in ha having in common with silicate glasses is that because they can be cooled so slowly, they also can be molded, just like a silicate glass. And there are examples now of uh, a group at Yale who are blowing metallic glass bottles. We're building something which I've called the Nestle, uh, which is neutron electrostatic levitation or neutron ESL. And that will be built here at Washington University. It will be designed to go into the spallation neutron source, which is the most intense pulse neutron source on Earth. It's just been completed uh, recently at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and it's coming online now. Um, so we're gonna be building that instrument to go there. With that instrument, because neutrons scatter off of the atoms, they give not only diffraction patterns like the X-rays do, but they interact more with the atoms and we can measure that change in energy. And by measuring the change in energy of the neutrons that are hitting, if you will, the atoms and scattering off, we can tell how the atoms are moving in the liquid. So we'll be able to get both structural information as well as dynamical information and hopefully be able to resolve the glass transition.